Chapter 9, Part 3 of Through the Brazilian Wilderness. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Darvinia. Through the Brazilian Wilderness by Theodore Roosevelt. Chapter 9 Down an Unknown River into the Equatorial Forest. Part 3. Next day, the 3rd of April, we began the descent of these sinister rapids of the chasm. Colonel Rondon had gone to the summit of the mountain in order to find a better trail for the burden-bearers, but it was hopeless, and they had to go along the face of the cliffs. Such an exploring expedition as that in which we were engaged of necessity involves hard and dangerous labor, and perils of many kinds. To follow downstream an unknown river, broken by innumerable cataracts and rapids, rushing through mountains, of which the existence has never been even guessed, bears no resemblance whatever to following even a fairly dangerous river which has been thoroughly explored, and has become, in some sort, a highway, so that experienced pilots can be secured as guides, while the portages have been pioneered, and trails chopped out and every dangerous feature of the rapids is known beforehand. In this case, no one could foretell that the river would cleave its way through steep mountain chains, cutting narrow clefts in which the cliff walls rose almost sheer on either hand. When a rushing river thus canyons, as we used to say out west, and the mountains are very steep, it becomes almost impossible to bring the canoes down the river itself, and utterly impossible to portage them along the cliff sides, while even to bring the loads over the mountain is a task of extraordinary labor and difficulty. Moreover, no one can tell how many times the task will have to be repeated, or when it will end, or whether the food will hold out. Every hour of work in the rapids is fraught with the possibility of the gravest disaster, and yet it is imperatively necessary to attempt it and all this is done in an uninhabited wilderness, or else a wilderness tenanted only by unfriendly savages, where failure to get through means death by disease and starvation. Wholesale disasters to South American exploring parties have been frequent. The first recent effort to descend one of the unknown rivers to the Amazon from the Brazilian highlands resulted in such a disaster. It was undertaken in 1889 by a party about as large as ours, under a Brazilian engineer officer, Colonel Talish Perish. In descending some rapids they lost everything, canoes, food, medicine, implements, everything. Fever smote them, and then starvation. All of them died except one officer and two men, who were rescued months later. Recently, in Guiana, a wilderness veteran, André, lost two-thirds of his party by starvation. Genuine wilderness exploration is as dangerous as warfare. The conquest of wild nature demands the utmost vigor, hardihood, and daring, and takes from the conquerors a heavy toll of life and health. Lyra, Kermit, and Cherry, with four of the men, worked the canoes halfway down the canyon. Again and again it was touch and go whether they could get by a given point. At one spot the channel of the furious torrent was only fifteen yards across. One canoe was lost, so that of the seven with which we had started, only two were left. Cherry labored with the other men at times, and also stood as guard over them, for while actually working, of course, no one could carry a rifle. Kermit's experience in bridge-building was invaluable in enabling him to do the rope-work, by which alone it was possible to get the canoes down the canyon. He and Lyra had now been in the water for days. Their clothes were never dry. Their shoes were rotten. The bruises on their feet and legs had become sores. On their bodies some of the insect bites had become festering wounds, as indeed was the case with all of us. Poisonous ants, biting flies, ticks, wasps, bees, were a perpetual torment. However, no one had yet been bitten by a venomous serpent, a scorpion, or a centipede, 
although we had killed all of the three within camp limits. Under such conditions, whatever is evil in men's nature comes to the front. On this day a strange and terrible tragedy occurred. One of the camaradas, a man of pure European blood, was the man named Julio, of whom I have already spoken. He was a very powerful fellow, and had been importunately eager to come on the expedition, and he had the reputation of being a good worker. But, like so many men of higher standing, he had had no idea of what such an expedition really meant, and under the strain of toil, hardship, and danger, his nature showed its true depths of selfishness, cowardice, and ferocity. He shirked all work, he shammed sickness. Nothing could make him do his share, and yet, unlike his self-respecting fellows, he was always shamelessly begging for favors. Kermit was the only one of our party who smoked, and he was continually giving a little tobacco to some of the camaradas, who worked especially well under him. The good men did not ask for it, but Julio, who shirked every labor, was always, and always in vain, demanding it. Colonel Rondon, Lyra, and Kermit each tried to get work out of him, and in order to do anything with him had to threaten to leave him in the wilderness. He threw all his tasks on his comrades, and moreover he stole their food as well as ours. On such an expedition the theft of food comes next to murder as a crime, and should, by rights, be punished as such. We could not trust him to cut down palms or gather nuts, because he would stay out and eat what ought to have gone into the common store. Finally, the men on several occasions themselves detected him stealing their food. Alone of the whole party, and thanks to the stolen food, he had kept in full flesh and bodily vigor. One of our best men was a huge negro named Paichon, a corporal and acting sergeant in the engineer corps. He had, by the way, literally torn his trousers to pieces, so that he wore only the tatters of a pair of old drawers, until I gave him my spare trousers when we lightened loads. He was a stern disciplinarian. One evening he detected Julio stealing food, and smashed him in the mouth. Julio came crying to us, his face working with fear and malignant hatred, but after investigation he was told that he had gotten off uncommonly lightly. The men had three or four carbines, which were sometimes carried by those who were not their owners. On this morning, at the outset of the portage, Pedrinho discovered Julio stealing some of the men's dried meat. Shortly afterward, Paichon rebuked him for, as usual, lagging behind. By this time we had reached the place where the canoes were tied to the bank, and then taken down, one at a time. We were sitting down, waiting for the last loads to be brought along the trail. Pedrinho was still in the camp we had left. Paichon had just brought in a load, left it on the ground with his carbine beside it, and returned on the trail for another load. Julio came in, put down his load, picked up the carbine, and walked back on the trail, muttering to himself, but showing no excitement. We thought nothing of it, for he was always muttering, and occasionally one of the men saw a monkey or big bird and tried to shoot it, so it was never surprising to see a man with a carbine. In a minute we heard a shot, and in a short time three or four of the men came up the trail to tell us that Paichon was dead, having been shot by Julio, who had fled into the woods. Colonel Rondon and Lyra were ahead. I sent a messenger for them, directed Cherry and Kermit to stay where they were and guard the canoes and provisions, and started down the trail with the doctor, an absolutely cool and plucky man, with a revolver but no rifle, and a couple of the camaradas. We soon passed the dead body of poor Paichon. He lay in a huddle, in a pool of his own blood, where he had fallen, shot through the heart. I feared that Julio had run amuck and intended merely to take more lives before he died, and that he would begin with Pedrinho, who was alone and unarmed in the camp we had left. Accordingly I pushed on, followed by my companions, looking sharply right and left, but when we came to the camp, the doctor quietly walked by me, remarking, "'My eyes are better than yours, Colonel. 
If he is in sight, I'll point him out to you, as you have the rifle. However, he was not there, and the others soon joined us, with the welcome news that they had found the carbine. The murderer had stood to one side of the path and killed his victim, when a dozen paces off, with deliberate and malignant purpose. Then, evidently, his murderous hatred had at once given way to his innate cowardice, and perhaps hearing some one coming along the path, he fled in panic terror into the wilderness. A tree had knocked the carbine from his hand. His footsteps showed that after going some rods he had started to return, doubtless for the carbine, but had fled again, probably because the body had then been discovered. It was questionable whether or not he would live to reach the Indian villages, which were probably his goal. He was not a man to feel remorse, never a common feeling, but surely that murderer was in a living hell, as with fever and famine leering at him from the shadows, he made his way through the empty desolation of the wilderness. Franca, the cook, quoted out of the melancholy proverbial philosophy of the people, the proverb, No man knows the heart of any one and then expressed with deep conviction a weird, ghostly belief I had never encountered before. Paichon is following Julio now, and will follow him until he dies. Paichon fell forward on his hands and knees, and when a murdered man falls like that, his ghost will follow the slayer as long as the slayer lives. We did not attempt to pursue the murderer, we could not legally put him to death, although he was a soldier who in cold blood had just deliberately killed a fellow soldier. If we had been near civilization, we would have done our best to bring him in and turn him over to justice. But we were in the wilderness, and how many weeks' journey were ahead of us we could not tell. Our food was running low, sickness was beginning to appear among the men, and both their courage and their strength were gradually ebbing. Our first duty was to save the lives and the health of the men of the expedition who had honestly been performing, and had still to perform, so much perilous labor. If we brought the murderer in, he would have to be guarded night and day on an expedition where there were always loaded firearms about, and where there would continually be opportunity and temptation for him to make an effort to seize food and a weapon and escape, perhaps murdering some other good man. He could not be shackled while climbing along the cliff slopes. He could not be shackled in the canoes, where there was always chance of upset and drowning. And standing guard would be an additional and severe penalty on the weary, honest men, already exhausted by overwork. The expedition was in peril, and it was wise to take every chance possible that would help secure success. Whether the murderer lived or died in the wilderness was of no moment, compared with the duty of doing everything to secure the safety of the rest of the party. For the two days following, we were always on the watch against his return, for he could have readily killed someone else, by rolling rocks down on any one of the men working on the cliff sides, or in the bottom of the gorge. But we did not see him until the morning of the third day. We had passed the last of the rapids of the chasm, and the four boats were going downstream when he appeared behind some trees on the bank, and called out that he wished to surrender and be taken aboard. For the murderer was an errant craven at heart. A strange mixture of ferocity and cowardice. Colonel Rondon's boat was far in advance. He did not stop nor answer. I kept on in similar fashion with the rear boats, for I had no intention of taking the murderer aboard, to the jeopardy of the other members of the party, unless Colonel Rondon told me that it would have to be done in pursuance of his duty as an officer of the army and a servant of the government of Brazil. At the first halt Colonel Rondon came up to me and told me that this was his view of his duty, but that he had not stopped because he wished first to consult me as the chief of the expedition. I answered that for the reasons enumerated above, I did not believe that in justice to the good men of the expedition we should jeopardize their safety by taking the murderer along, and that if the responsibility were mine, I should refuse to take him. 
but that he, Colonel Rondon, was the superior officer of both the murderer and of all the other enlisted men and army officers on the expedition, and in return was responsible for his actions to his own governmental superiors, and to the laws of Brazil, and that in view of this responsibility he must act as his sense of duty bade him. Accordingly, at the next camp, he sent back two men, expert woodsmen, to find the murderer and bring him in. They failed to find him. Note. The above account of all the circumstances connected with the murder was read to and approved as correct by all six members of the expedition. I have anticipated my narrative because I do not wish to recur to the horror more than is necessary. I now return to my story. After we found that Julio had fled, we returned to the scene of the tragedy. The murdered man lay with a handkerchief thrown over his face. We buried him beside the place where he fell. With axes and knives the camaradas dug a shallow grave while we stood by with bared heads. Then reverently and carefully we lifted the poor body, which but half an hour before had been so full of vigorous life. Colonel Rondon and I bore the head and shoulders. We laid him in the grave and heaped a mound over him, and put a rude cross at his head. We fired a volley for a brave and loyal soldier who had died doing his duty. Then we left him forever, under the great trees beside the lonely river. That day we got only halfway down the rapids. There was no good place to camp, but at the foot of one steep cliff there was a narrow, boulder-covered slope where it was possible to sling hammocks and cook and a slanting spot was found for my cot, which had sagged until by this time it looked like a broken-backed centipede. It rained a little during the night, but not enough to wet us much. Next day Lyra, Kermit, and Cherry finished their job, and brought the four remaining canoes to camp, one leaking badly from the battering on the rocks. We then went downstream a few hundred yards, and camped on the opposite side. It was not a good camping place, but it was better than the one we left. The men were growing constantly weaker under the endless strain of exhausting labor. Kermit was having an attack of fever, and Lyra and Cherry had touches of dysentery, but all three continued to work. While in the water, trying to help with an upset canoe, I had, by my own clumsiness, bruised my leg against a boulder, and the resulting inflammation was somewhat bothersome. I now had a sharp attack of fever, but thanks to the excellent care of the doctor, was over it in about forty-eight hours. But Kermit's fever grew worse, and he too was unable to work for a day or two. We could walk over the portages, however. A good doctor is an absolute necessity on an exploring expedition, in such a country as that we were in, under penalty of a frightful mortality among the members and the necessary risks and hazards are so great, the chances of disaster so large, that there is no warrant for increasing them by the failure to take all feasible precautions. Chapter 9, Part 4 of Through the Brazilian Wilderness This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Darvinia Through the Brazilian Wilderness by Theodore Roosevelt Chapter 9 Down an Unknown River into the Equatorial Forest Part 4 The next day we made another long portage round some rapids and camped at night still in the hot, wet, sunless atmosphere of the gorge. The following day, April 6th, we portaged past another set of rapids, which proved to be the last of the rapids of the chasm. For some kilometers we kept passing hills, and feared lest any moment we might again find ourselves fronting another mountain gorge, with, in such case, further days of grinding and perilous labor ahead of us, while our men were disheartened, weak, and sick. Most of them had already begun to have fever, their condition was inevitable after over a month's uninterrupted work of the hardest kind in getting through the long series of rapids we had just passed, and a long further delay, accompanied by wearing labor, would have almost certainly meant that the weakest among our party would have begun to die. 
There were already two of the camaradas who were too weak to help the others, their condition being such as to cause us serious concern. However, the hills gradually sank into a level plain, and the river carried us through it at a rate that enabled us during the remainder of the day to reel off thirty-six kilometres, a record that for the first time held out promise. Twice tapers swam the river while we passed, but not near my canoe. However, the previous evening Cherry had killed two monkeys, and Kermit one, and we all had a few mouthfuls of fresh meat. We had already had a good soup made out of a turtle Kermit had caught. We had to portage by one short set of rapids, the unloaded canoes being brought down without difficulty. At last, at four in the afternoon, we came to the mouth of a big river running in from the right. We thought it was probably the Ananas, but of course could not be certain. It was less in volume than the one we had descended, but nearly as broad. Its breadth at this point being ninety-five yards, as against one hundred and twenty for the larger river. There were rapids ahead, immediately after the junction, which took place in latitude ten degrees, fifty-eight minutes south. We had come two hundred and sixteen kilometers all told, and were nearly north of where we had started. We camped on the point of land between the two rivers. It was extraordinary to realize that here, about the eleventh degree, we were on such a big river, utterly unknown to the cartographers, and not indicated by even a hint on any map. We named this big tributary Rio Cardozo, after a gallant officer of the commission who had died of beriberi just as our expedition began. We spent a day at this spot, determining our exact position by the sun, and afterward by the stars, and sending on two men to explore the rapids in advance. They returned with the news that there were big cataracts in them, and that they would form an obstacle to our progress. They had also caught a huge illuroid fish, which furnished an excellent meal for everybody in camp. This evening at sunset, the view across the broad river from our camp, where the two rivers joined, was very lovely, and for the first time we had an open space in front of and above us, so that after nightfall the stars and the great waxing moon were glorious overhead, and against the rocks in midstream the broken water gleamed like tossing silver. The huge catfish which the men had caught was over three feet and a half long, with the usual enormous head, out of all proportions to the body, and the enormous mouth, out of all proportion to the head. Such fish, although their teeth are small, swallow very large prey. This one contained the nearly digested remains of a monkey. Probably the monkey had been seized while drinking from the end of a branch, and once engulfed in that yawning cavern, there was no escape. We Americans were astounded at the idea of a catfish making prey of a monkey, but our Brazilian friends told us that in the lower Madeira, and the part of the Amazon near its mouth, there is a still more gigantic catfish, which in similar fashion occasionally makes prey of man. This is a grayish white fish, over nine feet long, with the usual disproportionately large head and gaping mouth, with a circle of small teeth, for the engulfing mouth itself is the danger, not the teeth. It is called the piraiba, pronounced in four syllables. While stationed at the small city of Itacoatiara on the Amazon, at the mouth of the Madeira, the doctor had seen one of these monsters, which had been killed by the two men it had attacked. They were fishing in a canoe when it rose from the bottom, for it is a ground fish, and raising itself half out of the water lunged over the edge of the canoe at them, with open mouth. They killed it with their falcons, as machetes are called in Brazil. It was taken round the city in triumph in an ox-cart. The doctor saw it, and said it was three metres long. He said that swimmers feared it even more than the big caiman, because they could see the latter, whereas the former lay hid at the bottom of the water. Colonel Rondon said that in many villages where he had been on the lower Madeira, the people had built stockaded enclosures in the water, in which they bathed, not venturing to swim in the open water for fear of the piraiba and the big caiman. Next day, April 8th, we made five kilometres only, 
as there was a succession of rapids. We had to carry the loads past two of them, but ran the canoes without difficulty, for on the west side were long canals of swift water through the forest. The river had been higher, but was still very high, and the current raced round the many islands that at this point divided the channel. At four we made camp at the head of another stretch of rapids, over which the Canadian canoes would have danced without shipping a teaspoonful of water, but which our dugouts could only run empty. Cherry killed three monkeys, and Lyra caught two big piranhas, so that we were again, all of us, well provided with dinner and breakfast. When a number of men doing hard work are most of the time on half rations, they grow to take a lively interest in any reasonably full meal that does arrive. On the tenth we repeated the proceedings, a short quick run, a few hundred metres portage, occupying, however, at least a couple of hours, again a few minutes run, again other rapids. We again made less than five kilometres. In the two days we had been descending nearly a metre for every kilometre we made in advance, and it hardly seemed as if this state of things could last, for the aneroid showed that we were getting very low down. How I longed for a big main birch bark, such as that in which I once went down the Matawamkeag at high water. It would have slipped down these rapids as a girl trips through a country dance. But our loaded dugouts would have shoved their noses under every curl. The country was lovely. The wide river, now in one channel, now in several channels, wound among hills. The shower-freshened forest glistened in the sunlight. The many kinds of beautiful palm fronds and the huge pacova leaves stamped the peculiar look of the tropics on the whole landscape. It was like passing by water through a gigantic botanical garden. In the afternoon we got an elderly toucan, a piranha, and a reasonably edible side-necked river turtle. So we had fresh meat again. We slept, as usual, in earshot of rapids. We had been out six weeks, and almost all the time we had been engaged in wearily working our own way down and past rapid after rapid. Rapids are by far the most dangerous enemies of explorers and travellers who journey along these rivers. Next day was a repetition of the same work. All the morning was spent in getting the loads to the foot of the rapids, at the head of which we were encamped, down which the canoes were run empty. Then, for thirty or forty minutes, we ran down the swift, twisting river, the two lashed canoes almost coming to grief at one spot, where a swirl of the current threw them against some trees on a small submerged island. Then we came to another set of rapids, carried the baggage down past them, and made camp long after dark in the rain. A good exercise in patience for those of us who were still suffering somewhat from fever. No one was in really buoyant health. For some weeks we had been sharing part of the contents of our boxes with the camaradas, but our food was not very satisfying to them. They needed quantity, and the mainstay of each of their meals was a mass of palmitas, but on this day they had no time to cut down palms. We finally decided to run these rapids with the empty canoes, and they came down in safety. On such a trip it is highly undesirable to take any save necessary risks, for the consequences of disaster are too serious, and yet if no risks are taken the progress is so slow that disaster comes anyhow and it is necessary perpetually to vary the terms of the perpetual working compromise between rashness and over-caution. This night we had a very good fish to eat, a big silvery fellow called a pescada, of a kind we had not caught before. One day Trigueiro failed to embark with the rest of us, and we had to camp where we were next day to find him. Easter Sunday we spent in the fashion with which we were altogether too familiar. We only ran in a clear course for ten minutes, all told, and spent eight hours in portaging the loads past rapids, down which the canoes were run. The balsa was almost swamped. This day we caught twenty-eight big fish, mostly piranhas, and everybody had all he could eat for dinner and for breakfast the following morning. The forenoon of the following day was a repetition of this wearisome work. 
but late in the afternoon the river began to run in long, quiet reaches. We made fifteen kilometers, and for the first time in several weeks camped where we did not hear the rapids. The silence was soothing and restful. The following day, April 14th, we made a good run of some thirty-two kilometers. We passed a little river which entered on our left. We ran two or three light rapids, and portaged the loads by another. The river ran in long and usually tranquil stretches. In the morning, when we started, the view was lovely. There was a mist, and for a couple of miles the great river, broad and quiet, ran between the high walls of tropical forest, the tops of the giant trees showing dim through the haze. Different members of the party caught many fish, and shot a monkey, and a couple of jacare chinga birds, kin to a turkey, but to the size of a fowl, so we again had a camp of plenty. The dry season was approaching, but there were still heavy drenching rains. On this day the men found some new nuts of which they liked the taste, but the nuts proved unwholesome, and half of the men were very sick and unable to work the following day. In the balsa only two were left fit to do anything, and Kermit plied a paddle all day long. Accordingly, it was a rather sorry crew that embarked the following morning, April 15th, but it turned out a red-letter day. The day before we had come across cuttings, a year old, which were probably, but not certainly, made by pioneer rubber men. But on this day, during which we made twenty-five kilometres, after running two hours and a half, we found on the left bank a board on a post, with the initials J.A., to show the farthest up point which a rubber man had reached and claimed as his own. An hour further down we came on a newly built house in a little planted clearing, and we cheered heartily. No one was at home, but the house, of palm thatch, was clean and cool. A couple of dogs were on watch, and the belongings showed that a man, a woman, and a child lived there, and had only just left. Another hour brought us to a similar house, where dwelt an old black man who showed the innate courtesy of the Brazilian peasant. We came on these rubber men and their houses, in about latitude ten degrees twenty-four minutes. In mid-afternoon we stopped at another clean, cool, picturesque house of palm thatch. The inhabitants all fled at our approach, fearing an Indian raid for they were absolutely unprepared to have any one come from the unknown regions upstream. They returned, and were most hospitable and communicative, and we spent the night there. Said Antonio Correa to Kermit, It seems like a dream to be in a house again, and hear the voices of men and women, instead of being among those mountains and rapids. The river was known to them as the Castaño, and was the main affluent, or rather the left, or western branch, of the Aripuana. The Castaño is a name used by the rubber gatherers only. It is unknown to the geographers. We were, according to our informants, about fifteen days' journey from the confluence of the two rivers, but there were many rubber men along the banks, some of whom had become permanent settlers. We had come over three hundred kilometres in forty-eight days over absolutely unknown ground. We had seen no human being, although we had twice heard Indians. Six weeks had been spent in steadily slogging our way down through the interminable series of rapids. It was astonishing before, when we were on a river of about the size of the Upper Rhine, or Elbe, to realize that no geographer had any idea of its existence. But after all, no civilized man of any grade had ever been on it. Here, however, was a river with people dwelling along the banks, some of whom had lived in the neighborhood for eight or ten years, and yet on no standard map was there a hint of the river's existence. We were putting on the map a river, running through between five and six degrees of latitude, of between seven and eight, if, as should properly be done, the lower Aripuana is included as part of it of which no geographer, in any map published in Europe, or the United States, or Brazil, had even admitted the possibility of the existence. For the place actually occupied by it was filled, on the maps, by other, 
imaginary, streams, or by mountain ranges. Before we started, the Amazonas Boundary Commission had come up the lower Aripuana, and then the eastern branch, or upper Aripuana, to eight degrees forty-eight minutes, following the course which for a couple of decades had been followed by the rubbermen, but not going as high. An employee, either of this commission or of one of the big rubbermen, had been up the Castaño, which is easy of ascent in its lower course, to about the same latitude, not going nearly as high as the rubbermen had gone. This we found out while we ourselves were descending the lower Castaño. The lower main stream, and the lower portion of its main affluent, the Castaño, had been commercial highways for rubbermen and settlers for nearly two decades, and as we speedily found, were as easy to traverse as the upper stream which we had just come down was difficult to traverse, but the governmental and scientific authorities, native and foreign, remained in complete ignorance, and the rubbermen themselves had not the slightest idea of the headwaters, which were in country never hitherto traversed by civilized men. Evidently the Castaño was, in length, at least substantially equal, and probably superior, to the upper Aripuana. It now seemed even more likely that the Ananas was the headwaters of the main stream than of the Cardozo. For the first time this great river, the greatest affluent of the Madeira, was to be put on the map, and the understanding of its real position and real relationship and the clearing up of the complex problem of the sources of all these lower right-hand affluents of the Madeira, was rendered possible by the seven weeks of hard and dangerous labor we had spent in going down an absolutely unknown river, through an absolutely unknown wilderness. At this stage of the growth of world geography, I esteemed it a great piece of good fortune to be able to take part in such a feat, a feat which represented the capping of the pyramid which, during the previous seven years, had been built by the labor of the Brazilian Telegraphic Commission. We had passed the period when there was a chance of peril, of disaster, to the whole expedition. There might be risk ahead to individuals, and some difficulties and annoyances for all of us, but there was no longer the least likelihood of any disaster to the expedition as a whole. We now no longer had to face continual anxiety, the need of constant economy with food, the duty of labor with no end in sight, and bitter uncertainty as to the future. It was time to get out. The wearing work, under very unhealthy conditions, was beginning to tell on every one. Half of the camaradas had been down with fever, and were much weakened. Only a few of them retained their original physical and moral strength. Cherry and Kermit had recovered, but both Kermit and Lyra still had bad sores on their legs from the bruises received in the water-work. I was in worse shape. The after-effects of the fever still hung on, and the leg which had been hurt while working in the rapids with the sunken canoe had taken a turn for the bad and developed an abscess. The good doctor, to whose unwearied care and kindness I owe much, had cut it open and inserted a drainage tube an added charm being given the operation and the subsequent dressings. By the enthusiasm with which the Pionche and Bohashudish took part therein, I could hardly hobble, and was pretty well laid up. But there aren't no stop conductor while a battery's charging ground. No man has any business to go on such a trip as ours unless he will refuse to jeopardize the welfare of his associates by any delay caused by a weakness or ailment of his. It is his duty to go forward, if necessary, on all fours until he drops. Fortunately, I was put to no such test. I remained in good shape until we had passed the last of the rapids of the chasms. When my serious trouble came, we had only canoe-riding ahead of us. It is not ideal for a sick man to spend the hottest hours of the day stretched on the boxes in the bottom of a small open dugout, under the well-nigh intolerable heat of the torrid sun of the mid-tropics, varied by blinding, drenching downpours of rain. 
but I could not be sufficiently grateful for the chance. Kermit and Cherry took care of me as if they had been trained nurses, and Colonel Rondon and Lyra were no less thoughtful. The North was calling strongly to the three men of the North, Rocky Dell Farm to Cherry, Sagamore Hill to me, and to Kermit the call was stronger still. After nightfall we could now see the dipper well above the horizon, upside down, with the two pointers pointing to a north star below the world's rim. But the dipper, with all its stars. In our home country spring had now come, the wonderful northern spring of long glorious days, of brooding twilights, of cool delightful nights. Robin and bluebird, meadowlark and song sparrow, were singing in the mornings at home. The maple buds were red. Windflowers and bloodroot were blooming, while the last patches of snow still lingered. The rapture of the hermit thrush in Vermont, the serene golden melody of the wood thrush on Long Island, would be heard before we were there to listen. Each man to his home and to his true love. Each was longing for the homely things that were so dear to him, for the home people who were dearer still, and for the one who was dearest of all. End of chapter 9「This audiobook is brought to you by Full Audiobooks. Please like, subscribe, and click the bell icon if you love audiobooks. Chapter 10, Part 1 of Through the Brazilian Wilderness. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kalinda. Through the Brazilian Wilderness by Theodore Roosevelt. Chapter 10. To the Amazon and Home, Zoological and Geographical Results of the Expedition. Part 1. Our adventures and our troubles were alike over. We now experienced the incalculable contrast between descending a known and travelled river and one that is utterly unknown. After four days we hired a rubber man to go with us as guide. We knew exactly what channels were passable when we came to the rapids, when the canoes had to unload, and where the carry trails were. It was all child's play compared to what we had gone through. We had made long days' journeys, for at night we stopped at some palm-thatched house, inhabited or abandoned, and therefore the men were spared the labor of making camp, and we bought ample food for them so there was no further need of fishing and chopping down palms for the palm-tops. The heat of the sun was blazing, but it looked as if we had come back into the rainy season, where there were many heavy rains, usually in the afternoon, but sometimes in the morning or at night. The mosquitoes were sometimes rather troublesome at night. In the daytime the piums swarmed, and often bothered us even when we were in midstream. For four days there were no rapids we could not run without unloading. Then on the 19th we got a canoe from Senor Barboso. He was a most kind and hospitable man, who also gave us a duck and a chicken and some mandioc and six pounds of rice, and would take no payment. He lived in a roomy house with his dusky, cigar-smoking wife and his many children. The new canoe was light and roomy, and we were able to rig up a low shelter under which I could lie. I was still sick. At noon we passed the mouth of a big river, the Rio Branco, coming in from the left. This was about in latitude nine degrees thirty-eight minutes. Soon afterward we came to the first serious rapids, the Panella. We carried the boats past, ran down the empty canoes, and camped at the foot in a roomy house. The doctor bought a handsome trumpeter bird very friendly and confiding, which was thenceforth my canoe companion. We had already passed many inhabited and still larger number of uninhabited houses. The dwellers were rubbermen, but generally they were permanent settlers also, homemakers with their wives and children. Some, both of the men and women, were apparently of pure Negro blood, or of pure Indian or South European blood, but in the great majority all three strains were mixed in varying degrees. They were most friendly, courteous, and hospitable. Often they refused payment for what they could afford out of their little to give us. 
When they did charge, the prices were very high, as was but just, for they live back of the beyond, and everything costs them fabulously, save what they raise themselves. The cool, bare houses of poles and palm thatch contained little except hammocks and a few simple cooking utensils, and often a clock or sewing machine or Winchester rifle from our own country. They often had flowers planted, including fragrant roses. Their only livestock except the dogs were a few chickens and ducks. They planted patches of mandioc, maize, sugar-cane, rice, beans, squashes, pineapples, bananas, lemons, oranges, melons, peppers, and various purely native fruits and vegetables, such as the kinyabo, a vegetable fruit growing on the branches of a high bush which is cooked with meat. They get some game from the forest and more fish from the river. There is no representative of the government among them. Indeed, even now their very existence is barely known to the governmental authorities, and the church has ignored them as completely as the state. When they wish to get married, they have to spend several months getting down to and back from Manaus or some smaller city, and usually the first christening and the marriage ceremony are held at the same time. They have merely squatter's rights to the land, and are always in danger of being ousted by unscrupulous big men who come in late but with a title technically straight. The land laws should be shaped so as to give each of these pioneer settlers the land he actually takes up and cultivates, and upon which he makes his home. The small homemaker who owns the land which he tills with his own hands is the greatest element of strength in any country. These are real pioneer settlers. They are the true wilderness winners. No continent is ever really conquered or thoroughly explored by a few leaders or exceptional men, although such men can render great service. The real conquest, the thorough exploration and settlement, is made by a nameless multitude of small men, of whom the most important are, of course, the homemakers. Each treads most of the time in the footsteps of his predecessors, but for some few miles, at some time or other, he breaks new ground, and his house is built where no house has ever stood before. Such a man, the real pioneer, must have no strong desire for social life, and no need, probably no knowledge, of any luxury or of any comfort, save of the most elementary kind. The pioneer, who is always longing for the comfort and luxury of civilization, and especially of great cities, is no real pioneer at all. These settlers whom we met were contented to live in the wilderness. They had found the climate healthy and the soil fruitful. A visit to a city was a very rare event, nor was there any overwhelming desire for it. In short, these men, and those like them everywhere on the frontier between civilization and savagery in Brazil, are now playing the part played by our backwoodsmen, when over a century and a quarter ago they began the conquest of the great basin of the Mississippi, the part played by the Boer farmers for over a century in South Africa, and by the Canadians, when less than half a century ago they began to take possession of their northwest. Every now and then someone says that the last frontier is now to be found in Canada or Africa, and that it has almost vanished. On a far larger scale this frontier is to be found in Brazil, a country as big as Europe or the United States, and decades will pass before it vanishes. The first settlers came to Brazil a century before the first settlers came to the United States and Canada. For three hundred years progress was very slow. Portuguese colonial government at that time was almost as bad as Spanish. For the last half century and over there has been a steady increase in the rapidity of the rate of development, and this increase bids fair to be constantly more rapid in the future. The Paulistas, hunting for lands, slaves, and mines, were the first native Brazilians who a few hundred years ago played a great part in opening to a settlement vast stretches of wilderness. The rubber hunters have played a similar part during the last few decades. Rubber dazzled them, as gold and diamonds have dazzled other men and driven them forth to wander through the wide, waste spaces of the world. Searching for rubber, they made highways of rivers the very existence of which was unknown to the governmental authorities or to any map-makers. Whether they succeeded or failed, they everywhere left behind them settlers, who toiled, married, and brought up children. Settlement began. The conquest of the wilderness entered on its first stage. On the twentieth we stopped at the first store, where we bought, of course at a high price, sugar and tobacco for the camaradas. In this land of plenty the camaradas over ate, 
and sickness was as rife among them as ever. In Sherry's boat he himself and the steersman were the only men who paddled strongly and continuously. The storekeeper's stock of goods was very low, only what he still had left from that brought in nearly a year before, for the big boats, or batalos batalons, had not yet worked as far upstream. We expected to meet them somewhere below the next rapids, the inferno. The trader or rubberman brings up his year's supply of goods in a batalo, starting in February and reaching the upper course of the river early in May, when the rainy season is over. The parties of rubber explorers are then equipped and provisioned, and the settlers purchase certain necessities, and certain things that strike them as luxuries. This year the Brazil nut crop on the river had failed, a serious thing for all explorers and wilderness wanderers. On the twentieth we made the longest run we had made, fifty-two kilometers. Lyra took observations where we camped. We were in latitude eight degrees forty-nine minutes. At this camping place, the great, beautiful river was a little over three hundred meters wide. We were in an empty house. The marks showed that in the high water a couple of months back, the river had risen until the low part of the house was flooded. The difference between the level of the river during the floods and in the dry season is extraordinary. On the 21st we made another good run, getting down to the Inferno Rapids, which are in latitude 8 degrees 19 minutes south. Until we reached the Cardozo, we had run almost due north. Since then we had been running a little west of north. Before we reached these rapids we stopped at a large, pleasant thatch house and got a fairly big and roomy, as well as light, boat, leaving both our two smaller dugouts behind. Above the rapids a small river, the Madiraña, entered from the left. The rapids had a fall of over ten meters, and the water was very wild and rough. Met with for the first time, it would doubtless have taken several days to explore a passage, and with danger and labor get the boats down. But we were no longer exploring, pioneering, over unknown country. It is easy to go where other men have prepared the way. We had a guide. We took our baggage down by a carry, three-quarters of a kilometer long, and the canoes were run through known channels the following morning. At the foot of the rapids was a big house and store, and camped at the head were a number of rubber workers, waiting for the big boats of the head rubbermen to work their way up from below. They were a reckless set of brown daredevils. These men lead hard lives of labor and peril. They continually face death themselves, and they think little of it in, in connection with others. It is small wonder that they sometimes have difficulties with the tribes of utterly wild Indians with whom they are brought in contact although there is a strong Indian strain in their own blood. The following morning, after the empty canoes had been run down, we started and made a rather short afternoon's journey. We had to take the baggage by one rapids. We camped in an empty house in the rain. Next day we ran nearly fifty kilometers, the river making a long sweep to the west. We met half a dozen batelos, making their way upstream, each with a crew of six or eight men and two of them with women and children in addition. The crew were using very long poles with crooks, or rather the stubs of cut branches which served as crooks, at the upper end. With these, they hooked into the branches and dragged themselves up along the bank, in addition to poling where the depth permitted. The river was as big as the Paraguay at Corumba, but in striking contrast to the Paraguay, there were few water birds. We ran some rather stiff rapids, the Infernino, without unloading, in the morning. In the evening we landed for the night at a large, open, shed-like house, where there were two or three pigs, the first livestock we had seen other than poultry and ducks. It was a dirty place, but we got some eggs. The following day, the 24th, we ran down some fifty kilometers to the Carupanan Rapids, which by observation Lyra found to be in latitude seven degrees forty-seven minutes. We met several batelos, and the houses on the bank showed that the settlers were somewhat better off than was the case farther up. At the rapids was a big store, the property of Señor Caripe, the wealthiest rubberman who works on this river. Many of the men we met were in his employ. He has himself risen from the ranks, he was most kind and hospitable, and gave us another boat to replace the last of our shovel-nosed dugouts. The large open house was cool, clean, and comfortable. 
With these began a series of half a dozen sets of rapids, all coming within the next dozen kilometers, and all offering very real obstacles. At one we saw the graves of four men who had perished therein, and many more had died whose bodies were never recovered. The toll of human life had been heavy. Had we been still on an unknown river pioneering our own way, it would doubtless have taken us at least a fortnight of labor and peril to pass. But it actually took only a day and a half. All the channels were known, all the trails cut. Senor Caripe, a first-class waterman, cool, fearless, and brawny as a bull, came with us as a guide. Half a dozen times the loads were taken out and carried down. At one cataract the canoes were themselves dragged overland, elsewhere they were run down empty, shipping a good deal of water. At the foot of the cataract where we dragged the canoes overland we camped for the night. Here Kermit shot a big caiman. Our camp was alongside the graves of three men who at this point had perished in the swift water. Senor Caripe told us many strange adventures of rubber workers he had met or employed. One of his men, working at the Guiparana, got lost and after twenty-eight days found himself on the Madareña, which he thus discovered. He was in excellent health, for he had means to start a fire, and he found abundance of Brazil nuts and big land tortoises. Senor Caripe said that the rubber men now did not go above the ninth degree, or thereabouts, on the upper Aripuanan proper having found the rubber poor on the reaches above. A year previously five rubbermen, Mondoruku Indians, were working on the Kurumba at about that level. It is a difficult stream to ascend or descend. They made excursions into the forest for days at a time after caoutchouc. On one such trip, after fifteen days, they, to their surprise, came out on the Arupuanan. They returned and told their patron of their discovery, and by his orders took their caoutchouc overland to the Arupuanan, built a canoe, and ran down with their caoutchou to Manaus. They had now returned, and were working on the upper Arupuanan. The Mundurucus and Brazilians are always on the best terms, and the former are even more inveterate enemies of the wild Indians than are the latter. By mid-forenoon on April 26th we had passed the last dangerous rapids. The paddles were plied with hearty good will, Cherry and Kermit, as usual, working like the camaradas, and the canoes went dancing down the broad, rapid river. The equatorial forest crowded on either hand to the water's edge, and although the river was falling, it was still so high that in many places little islands were completely submerged, and the current raced among the trunks of the green trees. At one o'clock we came to the mouth of the Castaño proper, and in sight of the tent of Lieutenant Perinius, with the flags of the United States and Brazil flying before it, and with rifles firing from the canoes and the shore, we moored at the landing of the neat, soldierly, well-kept camp. The upper Aripuanan, a river of substantially the same volume as the Castaño, but broader at this point, and probably of less length, here joined the Castaño from the east, and the two together formed what the rubbermen called the lower Aripuanan. The mouth of this was indicated, and sometimes named on the maps, but only as a small and unimportant stream. We had been two months in the canoes, from the 27th of February to the 26th of April. We had gone over 750 kilometers. The river from its source, near the 13th degree, to where it became navigable and we entered it, had a course of some 200 kilometers, probably more, perhaps 300 kilometers. Therefore, we had now put on the map a river nearly 1,000 kilometers in length, of which the existence was not merely unknown, but impossible if the standard maps were correct. But this was not all. It seemed that this river of 1,000 kilometers in length was really the true upper course of the Arupuanan proper, in which case the total length was nearly 1,500 kilometers. Perinius had been waiting for us over a month at the junction of what the rubbermen called the Castaño and of what they called the upper Arupuanan. He had no idea as to which stream we would appear on, or whether we would appear upon either. On March 26th he had measured the volume of the two and found that the Castaño, although the narrower, was the deeper and swifter, and that in volume it surpassed the other by eighty-four cubic meters a second. Since then the Castaño had fallen. Our measurements showed it to be slightly smaller than the other. The volume of the river after the junction was about four thousand five hundred cubic meters a second. This was in seven degrees, thirty-four minutes. We were glad indeed to see Perinius and be at his attractive camp. 
we were only four hours above the little river hamlet of Sao a port of call for rubber steamers, from which the larger ones go to Manaus in two days. These steamers mostly belong to Senor Caripe. From Perineus we learned that Loriado and Fiala had reached Manaus on March 26th. On the swift water in the gorge of the Papagayo, Fiala's boat had been upset and all his belongings lost, while he himself had narrowly escaped with his life. I was glad indeed that the fine and gallant fellow had escaped. The Canadian canoe had done very well. We were no less rejoiced to learn that Amilcar, the head of the party that went down the Gui Parana, was also all right, although his canoe too had been upset in the rapids, and his instruments and all his notes lost. He had reached Manaus on April 10th. Fiala had gone home. Miller was collecting near Manaus. He had been doing capital work. The piranhas were bad here, and no one could bathe. Cherry, while standing in the water close to the shore, was attacked and bitten, but with one bound he was on the bank before any damage could be done. We spent a last night under canvas at Perineus's encampment. It rained heavily. Next morning we all gathered at the monument which Colonel Rondon had erected, and he read the orders of the day. These recited just what had been accomplished, set forth the fact that we had now by actual exploration and investigation, discovered that the river whose upper portion had been called the Duvida on the maps of the Telegraphic Commission, and the unknown major part of which we had just traversed, and the river known to a few rubbermen, but no one else, as the Castaño, and the lower part of the river known to the rubbermen as the Arupuanan, which did not appear on the maps, save as its mouth was sometimes indicated, with no hint of its size, were all parts of one and the same river, and that by order of the Brazilian government this river, the largest affluent of the Madeira, with its source near the thirteenth degree and its mouth a little south of the fifth degree, hitherto utterly unknown to cartographers and in large part utterly unknown to any one save the local tribes of Indians, had been named the Rio Roosevelt. We left Rondon, Lyra, and Perineus to take observations, and the rest of us embarked for the last time on the canoes and borne swiftly on the rapid current, we passed over one set of not very important rapids, and ran down to Senor Caripe's little hamlet of Sao Yau, which we reached about one o'clock on April 27th, just before a heavy afternoon rain set in. We had run nearly eight hundred kilometers during the sixty days we had spent in the canoes. Here we found and boarded Perineus's river steamer, which seemed in our eyes extremely comfortable. In the Signor's pleasant house we were greeted by the Signora, and they were both more than thoughtful and generous in hospitality. Ahead of us lay merely thirty-six hours by steamer to Manaus. Such a trip as that we had taken tries men as if by fire. Cherry had more than stood every test, and in him Kermit and I had come to recognize a friend with whom our friendship would never falter or grow less. End of chapter 10, part 1《ハッタパート2》《ハッタパート2》《ハッタパート2》《ハッタパート2》《ハッタパート2》《ハッタパート2》《ハッタパート2》《ハッタパート2》《ハッタパート2》《ハッタパート2》《ハッタパート2》《ハッタパート2》《ハッタパート2》《ハッタパート2》《ハッタパート2》《ハッタパート2》《ハッタパート2》《ハッタパート2》《ハッタパート2》《ハッタパート2》《ハッタパート2》《ハッタパート2》《ハッタパート2》《ハッタパート2》《ハッタパート2》《ハッタパート2》《ハッタパート2》《ハッタパート2》《ハッタパート2》《ハッタパート2》《ハッタパート2》《ハッタパート2》《ハッタパート2》《ハッタパート2》《Early the following afternoon our whole party, together with Signor Caripe, started on the steamer. It took us a little over twelve hours' swift steaming to run down to the mouth of the river, on the upper course of which our progress had been so slow and painful. From source to mouth, according to our itinerary, and to Lyra's calculations, the course of the stream down which we had thus come was about fifteen hundred kilometers in length, about nine hundred miles, perhaps nearly one thousand miles from its source near the thirteenth degree in the highlands to its mouth in the Madeira, near the fifth degree. Next morning we were on the broad, sluggish current of the lower Madeira, a beautiful tropical river. There were heavy rainstorms, as usual, although this is supposed to be the very end of the rainy season. In the afternoon we finally entered the wonderful Amazon itself, the mighty river which contains one-tenth of all the running water of the globe. It was miles across where we entered it, and indeed we could not tell whether the farther bank which we saw was that of the mainland or an island. 
we went up it until about midnight, and then steamed up the Rio Negro for a short distance, and at one in the morning of April 30th reached Manaus. Manaus is a remarkable city. It is only three degrees south of the equator. Sixty years ago it was a nameless little collection of hovels tenanted by a few Indians and a few of the poorest class of Brazilian peasants. Now it is a big handsome modern city with opera house, tramways, good hotels, fine squares and public buildings, and attractive private houses. The brilliant coloring and odd architecture give the place a very foreign and attractive flavor in northern eyes. Its rapid growth to prosperity was due to the rubber trade. This is now far less remunerative than formerly. It will undoubtedly in some degree recover, and in any event, the development of the immensely rich and fertile Amazonian valley is sure to go on, and it will be immensely quickened when closer connections are made with the Brazilian highland country lying south of it. Here we found Miller, and glad indeed we were to see him. He had made good collections of mammals and birds on the Gui Parana, the Madeira, and in the neighborhood of Manaus. His entire collection of mammals was really noteworthy. Among them was the only sloth any of us had seen on the trip. The most interesting of the birds he had seen was the Hoetzin. This is a most curious bird of a very archaic type. Its flight is feeble, and the naked young have spurs on their wings, by the help of which they crawl actively among the branches before their feathers grow. They swim no less easily at the same early age. Miller got one or two nests, and preserved specimens of the surroundings of the nests, and he made exhaustive records of the habits of the birds. Near Magasso, a jaguar had killed one of the bullocks that were being driven along for food. The big cat had not seized the ox with its claws by the head, but had torn open its throat and neck. Everyone was most courteous at Manaus, especially the governor of the state and the mayor of the city. Mr. Robiliard, the British consular representative, and also the representative of the Booth line of steamers, was particularly kind. He secured for us passage on one of the cargo boats of the line to Para, and thence on one of the regular cargo and passenger steamers to Barbados and New York. The Booth people were most courteous to us. I said good-bye to the camaradas with real friendship and regret. The parting gift I gave to each was in gold sovereigns, and I was rather touched to learn later that they had agreed among themselves each to keep one sovereign as a medal of honor and token that the owner had been on the trip. They were a fine set, brave, patient, obedient, and enduring. Now they had forgotten their hard times. They were fat from eating, at leisure all they wished. They were to see Rio Janeiro, always an object of ambition with men of their stamp, and they were very proud of their membership in the expedition. Later, at Belen, I said good-bye to Colonel Rondon, Dr. Cayezera, and Lieutenant Lyra. Together with my admiration for their hardihood, courage, and resolution, I had grown to feel a strong and affectionate friendship for them. I had become very fond of them, and I was glad to feel that I had been their companion in the performance of a feat which possessed a certain lasting importance. On May 1st we left Manaus for Belen Para, as until recently it was called. The trip was interesting. We steamed down through tempest and sunshine, and the towering forest was dwarfed by the giant river it fringed. Sunrise and sunset turned the sky to an unearthly flame of many colors above the vast water. It all seemed the embodiment of loneliness and wild majesty. Yet everywhere man was conquering the loneliness and wresting the majesty to his own uses. We passed many thriving, growing towns. At one we stopped to take on cargo. Everywhere there was growth and development. The change since the days when Bates and Wallace came to this then poor and utterly primitive region is marvelous. One of its accompaniments has been a large European, chiefly South European, immigration. The blood is everywhere mixed, and there is no color line, as in most English-speaking countries, and the Negro and Indian strains are very strong. But the dominant blood, the blood already dominant in quantity, and that is steadily increasing in dominance, is the olive white. Only rarely did the river show its full width. Generally we were in channels or among islands. The surface of the water was dotted with little islands of floating vegetation. Miller said that much of this came from the lagoons, such as those where he had been hunting, besides the Solimoans, lagoons filled with the huge and splendid Victoria lily, and with masses of water hyacinths. 
Miller, who was very fond of animals and always took much care of them, had a small collection which he was bringing back for the Bronx Zoo. And Agouti was so bad-tempered that he had to be kept solitary. But three monkeys, big, middle-sized, and little, and a young peccary, formed a happy family. The largest monkey cried, shedding real tears, when taken in the arms and pitied. The middle-sized monkey was stupid and kindly, and all the rest of the company imposed on it. The little monkey invariably rode on its back, and the peccary used it as a head-pillow when it felt sleepy. Belen, the capital of the state of Para, was an admirable illustration of the genuine and almost startling progress which Brazil has been making of recent years. It is a beautiful city nearly under the equator. But it is not merely beautiful. The docks, the dredging operations, the warehouses, the stores and shops, all tell of energy and success in commercial life. It is as clean, healthy, and well-policed a city as any of the size in the North Temperate Zone. The public buildings are handsome, the private dwellings attractive. There are a fine opera house, an excellent tramway system, and a good museum and botanical gardens. There are cavalry stables, where lights burn all night long to protect the horses from the vampire bats. The parks, the rows of palms and mango trees, the open-air restaurants, the gay life under the lights at night, all give the city its own special quality and charm. Belen and Manaus are very striking examples of what can be done in the mid-tropics. The governor of Para and his charming wife were more than kind. Cherry and Miller spent the day at the really capital zoological garden with the curator, Miss Snethlage. Miss Snethlage, a German lady, is a first-rate field and closet naturalist, and an explorer of note, who has gone on foot from the Jingu to the Tapajos. Most wisely, she has confined the Belen Zoo to the animals of the lower Amazon Valley, and in consequence I know of no better local zoological gardens. She has an invaluable collection of birds and mammals of the region, and it was a privilege to meet her and talk with her. We also met Professor Farabee of the University of Pennsylvania, the ethnologist. He had just finished a very difficult and important trip from Manaus by the Rio Branco to the highlands of Guiana, across them on foot, and down to the sea coast of British Guiana. He is an admirable representative of the men who are now opening South America to scientific knowledge. On May 7th we bade goodbye to our kind Brazilian friends and sailed northward for Barbados and New York. Zoologically, the trip had been a thorough success. Cherry and Miller had collected over 2,500 birds, about 500 mammals, and a few reptiles, batrachians, and fishes. Many of them were new to science, for much of the region traversed had never previously been worked by any scientific collector. Of course, the most important work we did was the geographic work, the exploration of the unknown river, undertaken at the suggestion of the Brazilian government, and in conjunction with its representatives. No piece of work of this kind is ever achieved, save as it is based on long-continued previous work. As I have before said, what we did was to put the cap on the pyramid that had been built by Colonel Rondon and his associates of the Telegraphic Commission during the six previous years. It was their scientific exploration of the Chapadao, their mapping the basin of the Uruena, and their descent of the Gui Parana that rendered it possible for us to solve the mystery of the River of Doubt. The work of the Commission, much the greatest work of the kind ever done in South America, is one of the many, many achievements which the Republican Government of Brazil has to its credit. Brazil has been blessed beyond the average of her Spanish-American sisters, because she won her way to Republicanism by evolution rather than revolution. They plunged into the extremely difficult experiment of democratic, of popular self-government, after enduring the atrophy of every quality of self-control, self-reliance, and initiative throughout three withering centuries of existence under the worst and most foolish form of colonial government, both from the civil and the religious standpoint, that has ever existed. The marvel is not that some of them failed, but that some of them have eventually succeeded in such striking fashion. Brazil, on the contrary, when she achieved independence, first exercised it under the form of an authoritative empire, then under the form of a liberal empire. When the republic came, the people were reasonably ripe for it. The great progress of Brazil, and it has been an astonishing progress, has been made under the republic. I could give innumerable examples and illustrations of this. The change that has converted Rio Janeiro from a picturesque pest hole into a singularly beautiful, healthy, clean, and efficient modern great city is one of these. Another is the work of the Telegraphic Commission. 
we put upon the map a river some fifteen hundred kilometers in length, of which the upper course was not merely utterly unknown to, but unguessed at by anybody, while the lower course, although known for years to a few rubber men, was utterly unknown to cartographers. It is the chief affluent of the Madeira, which is itself the chief affluent of the Amazon. The source of this river is between the twelfth and thirteenth parallels of latitude south and the fifty-ninth and sixtieth degrees of longitude west from Greenwich. We embarked on it at about latitude twelve degrees one minute south and about longitude sixty degrees fifteen minutes west. After that its entire course lay between the sixtieth and sixty-first degrees of longitude, approaching the latter most closely about latitude eight degrees fifteen minutes. The first rapids we encountered were in latitude 11 degrees 44 minutes, and in uninterrupted succession they continued for about a degree, without a day's complete journey between any two of them. At 11 degrees 23 minutes, the Rio Kermit entered from the left. At 11 degrees 22 minutes, the Rio Marciano Avila from the right. At 11 degrees 18 minutes, the Taunay from the left. At 10 degrees 58 minutes, the Cardozo from the right. In ten degrees twenty-four minutes we encountered the first rubberman. The Rio Branco entered from the left at nine degrees thirty-eight minutes. Our camp at eight degrees forty-nine minutes was nearly on the boundary between Mato Grosso and Amazonas. The confluence with the Arapuanan, which joined from the right, took place at seven degrees thirty-four minutes. The entrance into the Madeira was at about five degrees twenty minutes. This point we did not determine by observation, as it is already on the maps. The stream we had followed down was from the river's highest sources. We had followed its longest course. End of chapter 10 Recording by Kalinda in Lüneburg, Germany on February 22nd, 2009
Next, there are the travellers who visit the long-settled districts and colonial cities of the interior, travelling over land or river highways which have been traversed for centuries, but which are still primitive as regards the inns and the modes of conveyance. Such travelling is difficult in the sense that travelling in parts of Spain or southern Italy or the Balkan states is difficult. Men and women who have a taste for travel in out-of-way places, and who, therefore, do not mind slight discomforts and inconveniences, have the chance themselves to enjoy, and to make others profit by, travels of this kind in South America. In economic, social, and political matters, the studies and observations of these travelers are essential, in order to supplement, and sometimes to correct, those of travelers of the first category for it is not safe to generalize overmuch about any country, merely from a visit to its capital or its chief seaport. These travelers of the second category can give us most interesting and valuable information about quaint little belated cities, about backward country folk, kindly or the reverse, who show a mixture of the ideas of savagery with the ideas of an ancient peasantry and about rough old highways of travel, which in comfort do not differ much from those of medieval Europe. The travellers who go up or down the highway rivers that have been travelled for from one to four hundred years, rivers like the Paraguay and the Paraná, the Amazon, the Tapajos, the Madeira, the Lower Orinoco, come in this category. They can add little to our geographical knowledge, but if they are competent zoologists or archaeologists, especially if they live or sojourn long in a locality, their work may be invaluable from the scientific standpoint. The work of the archaeologists among the immeasurably ancient ruins of the lowland forests and the Andean plateau is of this kind. What Agassiz did for the fishes of the Amazon, and what Hudson did for the birds of the Argentine, are other instances of the work that can thus be done. Burton's writings on the interior of Brazil offer an excellent instance of the value of a sojourn or trip of this type, even without any especial scientific object. Of course, travellers of this kind need to remember that their experiences in themselves do not qualify them to speak as wilderness explorers exactly as a good archaeologist may not be competent to speak of current social or political problems, so a man who has done capital work as a tourist observer in little visited cities and along remote highways must beware of regarding himself as being thereby rendered fit for genuine wilderness work or competent to pass judgment on the men who do such work. To cross the Andes on muleback along the regular routes is a feat comparable to the feats of the energetic tourists, who by thousands traverse the mule trails in out-of-the-way nooks of Switzerland. An ordinary trip on the highway portions of the Amazon, Paraguay, or Orinoco in itself no more qualifies a man to speak of or to take part in exploring unknown South American rivers than a trip on the lower St. Lawrence qualifies a man to regard himself as an expert in a canoe voyage across Labrador, or the barren grounds west of Hudson Bay. A hundred years ago, even seventy or eighty years ago, before the age of steamboats and railroads, it was more difficult than at present to define the limits between this class and the next, and moreover in defining these limits I emphatically disclaim any intention of thereby attempting to establish a single standard of value for books of travel. Darwin's Voyage of the Beagle is to me the best book of the kind ever written. It is one of those classics which decline to go into artificial categories, and which stand by themselves. And yet Darwin, with his usual modesty, spoke of it as in effect a yachting voyage. Humboldt's work had a profound effect on the thought of the civilized world. His trip was one of adventure and danger, and yet it can hardly be called exploration proper. He visited places which had been settled and inhabited for centuries, and traversed places which had been travelled by civilized men for years before he followed in their footsteps. But these places were in Spanish colonies, and access to them had been forbidden by the mischievous and intolerant tyranny, ecclesiastical, political, and economic, which then rendered Spain the most backward of European nations. 
and Humboldt was the first scientific man of intellectual independence who had permission to visit them. To this day, many of his scientific observations are of real value. Bates came to the Amazon just before the era of Amazonian steamboats. He never went off the native routes of ordinary travel, but he was a devoted and able naturalist. He lived an exceedingly isolated, primitive, and laborious life for eleven years. Now, half a century after it was written, his Naturalist on the Amazon is as interesting and valuable as it ever was, and no book since written has in any way supplanted it. Travel of the third category includes the work of the true wilderness explorers who add to our sum of geographical knowledge, and of the scientific men who, following their several bents, also work in the untrodden wilds. Colonel Rondon and his associates have done much in the geographical exploration of unknown country, and Cherry and Miller have penetrated and lived for months and years in the wastes on their own resources, as incidents to their mammalogical and ornithological work. Professor Farabee, the anthropologist, is a capital example of the man who does this hard and valuable type of work. An immense mount of this true wilderness work, geographical and zoological, remains to be done in South America. It can be accomplished with reasonable thoroughness only by the efforts of very many different workers, each in his own special field. It is desirable that here and there a part of the work should be done in outline by such a geographic and zoological reconnaissance as ours. We would, for example, be very grateful for such work in portions of the interior of the Guianas, on the headwaters of the Xingu, and here and there along the eastern base of the Andes. But as a rule, the work must be specialized, and in its final shape it must be specialized everywhere. The first geographical explorers of the untrodden wilderness, the first wanderers who penetrate the wastes where they are confronted with starvation, disease, and danger and death in every form, cannot take with them the elaborate equipment necessary in order to do the thorough scientific work demanded by modern scientific requirements. This is true even of exploration done along the courses of unknown rivers. It is more true of the exploration, which must in South America become increasingly necessary, done across country, away from the rivers. The scientific work proper of these early explorers must be of a somewhat preliminary nature. In other words, the most difficult and therefore ordinarily the most important pieces of first-hand exploration are precisely those where the scientific work of the accompanying cartographer, geologist, botanist, and zoologist, must be furthest removed from finality. The zoologist who works to most advantage in the wilderness must take his time, and therefore he must normally follow in the footsteps of, and not accompany, the first explorers. The man who wishes to do the best scientific work in the wilderness must not try to combine incompatible types of work, nor to cover too much ground in too short a time. There is no better example of the kind of zoologist who does first-class field work in the wilderness than John D. Haseman, who spent from 1907 to 1910 in painstaking and thorough scientific investigation over a large extent of South American territory, hitherto only partially known or quite unexplored. Haseman's primary object was to study the characteristics and distribution of South American fishes, but as a matter of fact, he studied at first hand many other more or less kindred subjects, as may be seen in his remarks on the Indians, and in his excellent pamphlet on Some Factors of Geographical Distribution in South America. Haseman made his long journey with a very slender equipment, his extraordinarily successful field work being due to his bodily health and vigor and his resourcefulness, self-reliance and resolution. His writings are rendered valuable by his accuracy and common sense. The need of the former of these two attributes will be appreciated by whoever has studied the really scandalous fictions which have been published as genuine by some modern explorers and adventurers in South America, and the need of the latter by whoever has studied some of the wild theories propounded in the name of science concerning the history of life on the South American continent. There is, however, one serious criticism to be made on Haseman. The extreme obscurity of his style, 
an obscurity mixed with occasional bits of scientific pedantry, which makes it difficult to tell whether or not on some points his thought is obscure also. Modern scientists, like modern historians, and above all scientific and historical educators, should ever keep in mind that clearness of speech and writing is essential to clearness of thought, and that a simple, clear, and if possible vivid style is vital to the production of the best work in either science or history. Darwin and Huxley are classics, and they would not have been if they had not written good English. The thought is essential, but ability to give it clear expression is only less essential. Ability to write well, if the writer has nothing to write about, entitles him to mere derision. But the greatest thought is robbed of an immense proportion of its value, if expressed in a mean or obscure manner. Mr. Haseman has such excellent thought that it is a pity to make it a work of irritating labor to find out just what the thought is. Surely, if he will take as much pains with his writing as he has with the far more difficult business of exploring and collecting, he will become able to express his thought clearly and forcefully. At least he can, if he chooses, go over his sentences until he is reasonably sure that they can be parsed. He can take pains to see that his whole thought is expressed, instead of leaving vacancies which must be filled by the puzzled and groping reader. His own views, and his quotations from the views of others about the static and dynamic theories of distribution, are examples of an important principle so imperfectly expressed as to make us doubtful whether it is perfectly apprehended by the writer. He can avoid the use of those pedantic terms which are really nothing but offensive, and fortunately ephemeral scientific slang. There has been, for instance, a recent vogue for the extensive misuse, usually tautological misuse, of the word complexus, an excellent word if used rarely and for definite purposes. Mr. Haseman drags it in continually when its use is either pointless and redundant, or else serves purely to darken wisdom. He speaks of the Antillean complex, when he means the Antilles, of the organic complex, instead of the characteristic or bodily characteristics of an animal or species, and of the environmental complex, when he means nothing whatever but the environment. In short, Mr. Haseman, and those whose bad examples he in this instance follows, use complexus in much the same spirit as that displayed by the famous old lady who derived religious, instead of scientific, consolation from the use of the blessed word Mesopotamia. The reason that it is worth while to enter this protest against Mr. Haseman's style is because his work is of such real and marked value. The pamphlet on the distribution of South American species shows that to exceptional ability as a field worker he adds a rare power to draw with both caution and originality the necessary general conclusions from the results of his own observations and from the recorded studies of other men. And there is nothing more needed at the present moment among our scientific men than the development of a school of men who, while industrious and minute observers and collectors and cautious generalizers, yet do not permit the faculty of wise generalization to be atrophied by excessive devotion to labyrinthine detail. Haseman upholds with strong reasoning the theory that since the appearance of all but the lowest forms of life on this globe, there have always been three great continental masses, sometimes solid, sometimes broken, extending southward from the northern hemisphere, and from time to time connected in the north, but not in the middle regions or in the south, since the Carboniferous Epoch, he holds that life has been intermittently distributed southward along these continental masses, when there were no breaks in their southward connection, and intermittently exchanged between them when they were connected in the north. And he also upholds the view that from a common ancestral form the same species has been often developed in entirely disconnected localities, when in these localities the conditions of environment were the same. The opposite view is that there have been frequent connections between the great land masses, alike in the tropics, in the south temperate zone, and in the Antarctic region. The upholders of this theory base it almost exclusively on the distribution of living and fossil forms of life. 
That is, it is based almost exclusively on biological and not geological considerations. Unquestionably, the distribution of many forms of life, past and present, offers problems, which, with our present paleontological knowledge, we are wholly unable to solve. If we consider only the biological facts concerning some one group of animals, it is not only easy, but inevitable to conclude that its distribution must be accounted for by the existence of some former direct land bridge, extending, for instance, between Patagonia and Australia, or between Brazil and South Africa, or between the West Indies and the Mediterranean, or between a part of the Andean region and northeastern Asia. The trouble is that as more groups of animals are studied from the standpoint of this hypothesis, the number of such land bridges demanded to account for the existing facts of animal distribution is constantly and indefinitely extended. A recent book by one of the most learned advocates of this hypothesis calls for at least ten such land bridges between South America and all the other continents, present and past, of the world, since a period geologically not very remote. These land bridges, moreover, must, many of them, have been literally bridges, long narrow tongues of land thrust in every direction across the broad oceans. According to this view, the continental land masses have been in a fairly fluid condition of instability. By parity of reasoning, the land bridges could be made a hundred, instead of merely ten in number. The facts of distribution are in many cases inexplicable with our present knowledge. Yet, if the existence of widely separated but closely allied forms is habitually to be explained in accordance with the views of the extremists of this school, we could, from the exclusive study of certain groups of animals, conclude that at different periods the United States and almost every other portion of the earth were connected by land, and severed from all other regions by water, and, from the study of certain other groups of animals, arrive at directly opposite and incompatible conclusions. The most brilliant and unsafe exponent of this school was Amagino, who possessed and abused two gifts, both essential to the highest type of scientist, and both mischievous unless this scientist possess a rare and accurate habit of thought, joined to industry and mastery of detail, namely the gift of clear and interesting writing and the gift of generalization. Amagino rendered marked services to paleontology, but he generalized with complete recklessness from the slenderest data, and even these data he often completely misunderstood or misinterpreted. His favorite thesis included the origin of mammalian life and of man himself in southernmost South America, with, as incidents, the belief that the mammalian-bearing strata of South America were of much greater age than the strata with corresponding remains elsewhere, that in South America various species and genera of men existed in tertiary times, some of them at least as advanced as fairly well advanced modern savages, that there exist various land bridges between South America and other southern continents, including Africa, and that the ancestral types of modern mammals and of man himself wandered across one of these bridges to the old world, and that thence their remote descendants, after ages of time, returned to the new. In addition to valuable investigations of fossil-bearing beds in the Argentine, he made some excellent general suggestions, such as that the pithecoid apes, like the baboons, do not stand in the line of man's ancestral stem, but represent a divergence from it, away from humanity, and toward a retrogressive bestialization. But of his main theses he proves none, and what evidence we have tells against them. At the Museum of La Plata I found that the authorities were practically a unit in regarding his remains of tertiary men and proto-men, as being either the remains of tertiary American monkeys or of American Indians from strata that were long post-tertiary. The extraordinary discovery, due to that eminent scientist and public servant Dr. Moreno, of the remains of man associated with the remains of the great extinct South American fauna, of the Malodon, 
of a giant ungulate of a huge cat like the lion, and of an extraordinary aberrant horse, of a wholly different genus from the modern horse, conclusively shows that in its later stages the South American fauna consisted largely of types that elsewhere had already disappeared, and that these types persisted into what was geologically a very recent period, only some tens of thousands of years ago, when savage man of practically a modern type had already appeared in South America. The evidence we have, so far as it goes, tends to show that the South American fauna always has been more archaic in type than the arctogeal fauna of the same chronological level. To loose generalizations and to elaborate misinterpretations of paleontological records, the kind of work done by Mr. Haseman furnishes an invaluable antiscorbutic. To my mind, he has established a stronger presumption in favor of the theory he champions than has been established in favor of the theories of any of the learned and able scientific men from whose conclusions he dissents. Further research, careful, accurate, and long-extended, can alone enable us to decide definitely in the matter. And this research, to be effective, must be undertaken by many men, each of whom shall in large measure possess Mr. Haseman's exceptional power of laborious work, both in the field and in the study, his insight and accuracy of observation, and his determination to follow truth with inflexible rectitude, wherever it may lead. One of the greatest among the many great qualities which lifted Huxley and Darwin above their fellows. End of Appendix A Appendix B, Part 1 of Through the Brazilian Wilderness. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Sam Elmuth. Through the Brazilian Wilderness by Theodore Roosevelt. Appendix B The Outfit for Traveling in the South American Wilderness. Part 1. South America includes so many kinds of country that it is impossible to advise a scheme of equipment which shall suit all. A hunting trip in the Pantanals in the swamp country of the upper Paraguay offers a simple problem. An exploring trip through an unknown tropical forest region, even if the work is chiefly done by the river, offers a very difficult problem. All that I can pretend to do is to give a few hints as the results of our own experience. For bedding, there should be a hammock, mosquito net, and light blanket. These can be obtained in Brazil. For a tent, a light fly is ample. Ours were brought with us from New York. In exploring, only the open fly should be taken. But on trips where weight of luggage is no objection, there can be walls to the tent and even a canvas floor cloth. Camp chairs and a camp table should be brought. Any good outfitter in the United States will supply them and not thrown away until it becomes imperative to cut everything down. On a river trip, first-class pulleys and ropes, preferably steel and at any rate very strong, should be taken. Unless the difficulties of transportation are insuperable, canvas and cement canoes, such as can be obtained from various firms in Canada and the United States, should by all means be taken. They are incomparably superior to the dugouts, but on different rivers, wholly different canoes of wholly different sizes will be needed. On some, steam or electric launches may be used. It is not possible to lay down a general rule. As regards arms, a good plain 12 bore shotgun with a 30-30 rifle barrel underneath the others is the best weapon to have constantly in one's hands in the South American forests, where big game is rare and yet may at any time come in one's path. When specially hunting the jaguar, marsh deer, tapa, or big peccary, an ordinary light repeating rifle, the 30-30, 30-40, or 256, is preferable. No heavy rifle is necessary for South America. Tin boxes or trunks are the best in which to carry one spare things. 
A good medicine chest is indispensable. Nowadays, doctors know so much of tropical diseases that there is no difficulty in fitting one out. It is better not to make the trip at all than to fail to take an ample supply of quinine pills. Cholera pills and cathartic pills come next in importance. In liquid shape, there should be a serum to inject for the stoppage of amoebic dysentery and anti-snake venom serum. Fly dope should be taken in quantities. For clothing, Kermit and I used what was left over from our African trip. Sun helmets are the best in the open. Slouch hats are infinitely preferable in the woods. There should be hobnailed shoes, the nails many and small, not few and large, and also moccasins or rubber-soled shoes, and light flexible leggings. Tastes differ in socks. I like mine of thick wool. A khaki-colored shirt should be worn, or, as a better substitute, a khaki jacket with many pockets. Very light underclothes are good. If one's knees and legs are uncomfortably tender, knickerbockers with long stockings and leggings should be worn. Ordinary trousers tend to bind the knee. Better still, if one's legs will stand the exposure, are shorts, not coming down to the knee. A kilt would probably be best of all. Kermit wore shorts in the Brazilian forest, and he had already worn them in Africa, in Mexico, and in the New Brunswick woods. Some of the best modern hunters always wear shorts. As for example, that first-class sportsman, the Duke of Alva. Mr. Fiala, after the experience of his trip down to the Papagayo, the Georgiana, and the Tapajos, gives his judgment about equipment and provisions as follows. The history of South American exploration has been full of the losses of canoes and cargoes and lives. The native canoe, made from the single trunk of a forest giant, is the craft that has been used. It is durable, and if lost, can be readily replaced from the forest by good men with axes and adzes. But, because of its great weight and low freeboard, it is unsuitable as a freight carrier and by reason of the limitations of its construction, is not of the correct form to successfully run the rapid and bad waters of many of the South American rivers. The North American Indian has undoubtedly developed a vastly superior craft in the birch bark canoe, and with it will run rapids that a South American Indian, with his log canoe, would not think of attempting, though, as a general thing, the South American Indian is a wonderful waterman, the equal, and in some ways, the superior of his northern contemporary. At the many carries or portages that the light birch bark canoe, or its modern representative, the canvas covered canoe, can be picked up bodily and carried by from two to four men for several miles, if necessary, while the log canoe has to be hauled by ropes and back-breaking labor over rollers that have first to be cut from trees in the forest or at great risk, led along the edge of the rapids with ropes and hooks and poles, the men often up to their shoulders in the rushing waters, guiding the craft to a place of safety. The native canoe is so long and heavy that it is difficult to navigate without some bumps on the rocks. In fact, it is usually dragged over the rocks in the shallow water near the shore in preference to taking the risk of a plunge through the rushing volume of deeper water, for reasons stated above. The North American canoe can be turned with greater facility in critical moments in bad water. Many a time I heard my steersman exclaim with delight as we took a difficult passage between two rocks with our loaded Canadian canoe. In making the same passage, the dugout would go sideways towards the rapid until by supreme effort by her three powerful paddlers and steersmen would right her just in time. The native canoe would ship great quantities of water in the places the Canadian canoe came through without taking any water on board. We did bump a few rocks under the water, but the canoe was so elastic that no damage was done. Our 19-foot canvas-covered freight canoe, a type especially built for the purpose on deep, full lines, with high freeboard, weighed about 160 pounds, and would carry a ton of cargo with ease and also take it safely where the same cargo distributed among two or three native 30 or 35 foot canoes 
would be lost. The native canoes weigh from about 900 to 2,500 pounds and more. In view of the above facts, the explorer traveler is advised to take with him the North American canoe if he intends serious work. Two canoes would be a good arrangement for from five to seven men with at least one steersman and two paddlers to each canoe. The canoes can be purchased in two sizes and nested for transportation, an arrangement which would save considerable expense in freight bills. At least six paddles should be packed with each boat, in length four and one half, four and three fourths, and five feet. Other paddles from six and one half feet to eight and one half feet should be provided for steering oars. The native paddler, after he has used the light Canadian paddle, prefers it to the best native make. My own paddlers lost or broke all of their own paddles so as to get the North American ones, which they marked with their initials and used most carefully. To each canoe, it would be well to have two copper air tanks, one fore, one aft, a handhole in each, with a tight water screw cover on hatch. In these tanks could be kept a small supply of matches, the chronometer or watch which is used for position, and the scientific records and diary. Of course, the fact should be kept in mind that these are air tanks, not to be used so as to appreciably diminish their buoyancy. Each canoe should also carry a small repair kit attached to one of the thwarts, containing cement, a piece of canvas, same as cover of canoe, copper tacks, rivets, and some galvanized nails, a good hatchet and hammer, a small can of canoe paint, spar varnish, and copper paint for worn places would be a protection against termites and torrential downpours. In concluding, the subject of canoes I can state that the traveler in South America will find no difficulty in disposing of his craft at the end of his trip. Motors. We had with us a three and one half horsepower motor, which could be attached to stern or gunwale of canoe or boat. It was made by the Evinrude Motor Company, who had a magneto placed in the flywheel of the engine, so that we never had to resort to the battery to run the motor. Though the motor was left out in the rain and sun, often without a cover, by careless native help, it never failed us. We found it particularly valuable in going against the strong current of the Sepotubo River, where several all-night trips were made upstream, the motor attached to a heavy boat. For exploration upstream, it would be valuable, particularly as it is easily portable, weighing for the two-horsepower motor 50 pounds, for three and one-half horsepower 100 pounds. If a carburetor could be attached so that kerosene could be used, it would add to its value many times, for kerosene can be purchased almost anywhere in South America. Tents There is nothing better for material than the light waterproof sea island cotton of American manufacturer, made under the trade name of waterproof silk. It keeps out the heaviest rain and is very light. Canvas becomes water-soaked, and cravenetted material lets the water through. A waterproof canvas floor is a luxury, and though it adds to the weight, it may with advantage be taken on ordinary trips. The tent should be 8 by 8 or 8 by 9 feet, large enough to swing a comfortable hammock. A waterproof canvas bag, a loose-fitting envelope for the tent should be provided. Native help is, as a rule, careless and the bag would save wear and tear. Hammocks The hammock is a South American bed, and the traveler will find it exceedingly comfortable. After leaving the larger cities and settlements, a bed is a rare object. All the houses are provided with extra hammock hooks. The traveler will be entertained hospitably, and after dinner will be given two hooks upon which to hang his hammock for he will be expected to have his hammock and, in an insect time, his net, if he has nothing else. As a rule, a native hammock and net can be procured in the field, but it is best to take a comfortable one along, arranged with a fine meshed net. 
in regard to the folding cot. It is heavy, and its numerous legs form a sort of highway system over which all sorts of insects can crawl up to the sleeper. The ants are special pests, and some of them can bite with enthusiastic vigor of beasts many times their size. The canvas floor in the tent obviates to a degree the insect annoyance. The headwaters of the rivers are usually reached by pack trains of mules and oxen. The primitive ox cart also comes in where the trail is not too bad. Uh, 160 to 180 pounds is a good load for pack animals, and none of the cases should weigh more than 50 or 60 pounds. Each case should be marked with its contents and gross and net weight in kilos. For personal baggage, the light fiber sample case used by traveling men in the United States does admirably. The regulation fiber case with its metal binding sold for the purpose is too heavy and has the bad feature of swelling up under the influence of rain and dampness, often necessitating the use of an axe or heavy hammer to remove cover. The ordinary fiber trunk is good for rail and steamer travel, but it is absolutely unpractical for muleback or canoe. The fiber sample case could be developed into a container particularly fitted for exploration. The fiber should be soaked in hot paraffin and then hot calendared or hot pressed. This case could then be covered with waterproof canvas with throat opening like a duffel bag. The waterproof duffel bags usually sold are too tight in texture and wear through. A heavier grade should be used. The small duffel bag is very convenient for hammock and clothing, but generally the thing wanted will be at the bottom of the bag. We took with us a number of small cotton bags. As cotton is very absorbent, I had them paraffined. Each bag was tagged, and all were placed in a large duffel bag. The light fiber case described above made just the right size for mule pack, divided by partitions, and covered with a duffel bag would prove a great convenience. The light steel boxes made in England for travelers in India and Africa would prove of value in South American exploration. They have the advantage of being insect and waterproof, and the disadvantage of being expensive. It would be well if the traveler measured each case for personal equipment and computed the limit of weight that it would carry and still fill out. By careful distribution of light and heavy articles in the different containers, he could be sure of his belongings floating if accidentally thrown into the water. It is not always possible to get comfortable native saddles. They are all constructed on heavy lines with thick padding which becomes water-soaked in the rainy season. A United States military saddle with a Whitman or McClellan tree would be a positive luxury. Neither of them is padded, so would be the correct thing for all kinds of weather. The regulation army saddle blanket is also advised as a protection for the mule's back. The muleteer should wash the saddle blanket often. For a long mule back trip through a game country, it would be well to have a carbine boot on the saddle, United States Army, and saddle bags with canteen and cup. In a large pack train, much time and labor are lost every morning collecting the mules which strayed while grazing. It would pay in the long run to feed a little corn at a certain hour every morning in camp, always ringing a bell or blowing a horn at the time. The mules would get accustomed to receiving the feed and would come to camp for it at the signal. All the rope that came to my attention in South America was three-strand hemp, a hard material, good for standing rigging, but not good for tackle or for use aboard canoes. A four-ply bolt rope of best manila, made in New Bedford, Massachusetts, should be taken. It is the finest and most pliable line in the world, as any old whaler will tell you. Get a sailor from the old school to relay the coils before you go into the field, so that the rope will be ready for use. 5 eighths to 7 eighths inch diameter is large enough. 
A few balls of marline come in conveniently, as also does heavy linen fish line. A small-sized duffel bag should be provided for each of the men as a container for hammock and net, spare clothing, and a mess kit. A small waterproof pouch or bag should be furnished also for matches, tobacco, etc. The men should be limited to one duffel bag each. These bags should be numbered consecutively. In fact, every piece in the entire equipment should be thus numbered and a list kept in detail in a book. The explorer should personally see that each of his men has a hammock, net, and poncho, for the native, if left unsupervised, will go into the field with only the clothing he has on. Food Though South America is rich in food and food possibilities, she has not solved the problem of living economically on her frontiers. The prices asked for food in the rubber districts we passed through were amazing. Five mil race, one dollar and fifty cents, was cheap for chicken, and eggs at five hundred race, fifteen cents a piece, were a rarity. Sugar was bought at the rate of one to two mil race a kilo, in a country where sugar cane grows luxuriantly. The main dependence is the mandioc or farina, as it is called. It is the bread of the country, and is served at every meal. The native puts it on his meat and in his soup, and mixes it with his rice and beans. When he has nothing else, he eats the farina, as it is called, by the handful. It is seldom cooked. The small mandioc tubers, when boiled, are very good, and are used instead of potatoes. Native beans are nutritious, and form one of the chief foods. In the field, the native cook wastes much time. Generally provided with an inadequate cooking equipment, hours are spent cooking beans after the day's work, and then, of course, they are often only partially cooked. A kettle or aluminum Dutch oven should be taken along, large enough to cook enough beans for both breakfast and dinner. The beans should be cooked all night, a fire kept burning for the purpose. It would only be necessary then to warm the beans for breakfast and dinner, the two South American meals. For meat, the rubber hunter and explorer depends upon his rifle and fish hook. The rivers are full of fish which can be readily caught, and in Brazil, the tapi, capybara, paca, agouti, two or three varieties of deer, and two varieties of wild pig can occasionally be shot. Most of the monkeys are used for food. Turtles and turtle eggs can be had in season, and a great variety of birds, some of them delicious in flavor and heavy in meat. In the hot, moist climate, fresh meat will not keep, and even salted meat has been known to spoil. For use on the Roosevelt expedition, I arranged a ration for five men for one day packed in a tin box. The party which went down the Duvita made each ration due for six men for a day and a half, and in addition gave over half the bread or hardtack to the camaradas. By placing the day's allowance of bread in the same box, it was lightened sufficiently to float if dropped into water. There were seven rations in the arrangement of food in these boxes, and they were numbered from one to seven so that each different box could be used every day of the week. In addition to the food, each box contained a cake of soap, a piece of cheesecloth, two boxes of matches, and a box of table salt. These ten boxes were lacquered to protect from rust and enclosed in wooden cases for transportation. A number in large type was printed on each. Number one was cased separately. Numbers two and three four and five, six and seven, were cased together. For canoe travel, the idea was to take these wooden cases off. I did not have an opportunity, personally, to experience the management of these food cases. We had sent them all ahead by pack train for the explorers of the Duvida River. The exploration of the Papagayo was decided upon during the march over the plateau of Mato Grosso, and was accomplished with dependence upon native food only. Daily Ration for Five Men Sixteen of Rice on Sunday, 
Tuesday, and Friday. 13 of oatmeal on Monday, Thursday, and Saturday. 100 of bread on Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. 18 of tea biscuits on Sunday, Tuesday, and Thursday. 21 of ginger snaps on Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and Saturday. 11 of dehydrated potatoes on Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. 5 of dehydrated onions on Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. 8 of herbs worst on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. 6 of evaporated soups on Sunday, Tuesday, and Saturday. 25 of baked beans on Thursday and Saturday. 17 of condensed milk on Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. 44 of bacon on Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. 56 of roast beef on Monday. 56 of braised beef on Tuesday and Saturday. 70 of corned beef on Wednesday. 78 of ox tongue on Thursday. 72 of curry and chicken on Friday. 61 of boned chicken on Sunday. Fruits. 5 of evaporated berries on Monday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Saturday. 20 of figs on Sunday and Tuesday. 16 of dates on Friday. 32 of sugar on Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. 10 of coffee on Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. 5 of tea on Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. 4 of salt on Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. 16 of sweet chocolate on Wednesday. Each box also contained one yard of muslin for each day of the week, two boxes of matches for every day of the week, and one cake of soap for every day of the week. Above weights of food are net in avoirdupois ounces. Each complete ration with its tin container weighed nearly 27 pounds. The 5 pounds over net weight of daily ration was taken up in tin necessary for protection of food. The weight of component parts of daily ration had to be governed to some extent by the size of the commercial package in which the food could be purchased on short notice. Austin, Nichols & Company of New York supplied the food stores for my polar expedition work day and night to complete the packing of the rations on time. The food cases described above were used on Colonel Roosevelt's descent of the Rio da Duvida, and also used by the party who journeyed down from the Gai Parana and Madeira rivers. Leo Miller, the naturalist, who was a member of the last-named party, arrived in Manaus, Brazil, while I was there, and in answer to my question, told me that the food served admirably and was good but that the native cooks had a habit of opening a number of cases at a time to satisfy their personal desire for special delicacies. Bacon was the article most sought for. Speaking critically, for a strenuous piece of work like the exploration of the Duvida, the food was somewhat bulky. A ration arrangement, such as I used on my sled trips north, would have contained more nutritious elements in a smaller space. We could have done without many of the luxuries, 
but the exploration of the Duvida had not been contemplated and had no place in the itinerary mapped out in New York. The change of plan and the decision to explore the Duvida River came out in Rio Janeiro long after our rations had been made and shipped. Mate, the tea of Brazil and Paraguay, used in most of the states of South America, should not be forgotten. It is a valuable beverage. With it, a native can do a wonderful amount of work on little food. Upon the tired traveler, it has a very refreshing effect. Dr. Peckelt, celebrated chemist of Rio de Janeiro, has compared the analysis of mate with those of green tea, black tea, and coffee, and obtained the following result. In 1,000 parts of green tea, 7.90 parts are natural oil, 22.20 parts are chlorophyll, 22.20 are resin, 178.09 are tannin, alkaloids, 4.50 parts are metana, 464.00 are extractive substances, 175.80 parts are cellulose and fibers, 85.60 parts are ashes. In 1,000 parts of black tea, 0 0.06 parts are natural oil, 18.14 parts are chlorophyll, 34.40 parts are resin, 128.80 parts are tannin, alkaloids, 4.3 parts are metana, 390.00 parts are extractive substances, 283.20 parts are cellulose and fibers, and 25.61 parts are ashes. In 1,000 parts of coffee, 0.41 parts are natural oil, 13.66 parts are chlorophyll, 13.66 parts are resin, 16.39 parts are tannin, alkaloids, 2.66 parts are metana, 270.67 parts are extractive substances, 178.83 parts are cellulose and fibers, and 25.61 parts are ashes. In 1,000 parts of mate, 0 0.01 parts are natural oil, 62.00 parts are chlorophyll, 20.69 parts are resin, 12.28 parts are tannin, alkaloids, 2.5 parts are metana, 238.83 parts are extractive substances, 180.00 parts are cellulose and fibers, and 38 Point one one parts are ashes. Manner of Preparation The mate tea is prepared in the same manner as the Indian tea, that is to say, by pouring upon it boiling water during 10 to 15 minutes before using. To obtain a good infusion, five spoonfuls of mate are sufficient for a liter of water. End of Appendix B, Part 1《Appendix B, Part 2 of Through the Brazilian Wilderness. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tom Clifton. Through the Brazilian Wilderness by Theodore Roosevelt. Appendix B, The Outfit for Traveling in the South American Wilderness, Part 2. Some experiments have been made lately with the use of mate in the German army, and probably it would be a valuable beverage for use with our own troops. Two plates and a cup, knife, fork, and spoon should be provided for each member of the party. The United States Army mess kit would serve admirably. Each man's mess kit should be numbered to correspond with the number on his duffel bag. An aluminum kettle for lightness cooking outfit, or the Dutch oven mentioned, with three or four kettles nested within, 
a coffee-pot or teapot would suffice, the necessary large spoons and forks for the cook, a small meat grinder, and a half-dozen skinning knives could all be included in the fiber case. These outfits are usually sold with the cups, plates, etc. for the table. As before suggested, each member of the party should have his own mess kit. It should not be carried with the general cooking outfit. By separating the eating equipments thus, one of the problems of hygiene and cleanliness is simplified. Rifles, Ammunition A heavy rifle is not advised. The only animals that can be classed as dangerous are the jaguar and white-jawed peccary, and a thirty thirty or forty four caliber is heavy enough for such game. The forty four caliber Winchester or Remington carbine is the arm generally used throughout South America, and forty four caliber is the only ammunition one can depend on securing in the field. Every man has his own preference for an arm. However, there is no need of carrying a nine or ten pound weapon when a rifle weighing only from six and three fourths to seven and one half pounds will do all that is necessary. I personally prefer a small caliber rifle as it can be used for birds also. The three barreled gun, combining a double shotgun and a rifle, is an excellent weapon and it is particularly valuable for the collector of natural history specimens. A new gun has just come on the market which may prove valuable in South America where there is such a variety of game, a four-barrel gun, weighing only eight and one-fourth pounds. It has two shotgun barrels, one thirty to forty-four caliber rifle, and the rib separating the shotgun barrels is bored for a twenty-two caliber rifle cartridge. The latter is particularly adapted for the large food birds, which a heavy rifle bullet might tear. Twenty-two caliber ammunition is also very light, and the long twenty-two caliber exceedingly powerful. Unless in practice it proves too complicated, it would seem to be a good arm for all-round use. Sixteen to twenty gauge is large enough for the shotgun barrels. Too much emphasis cannot be placed upon the need of being provided with good weapons. After the loss of all our arms in the rapids, we secured four poor rusty rifles which proved of no value. We lost three deer, a taper, and other game, and finally gave up the use of the rifles, depending on the hook and line. A twenty-five or thirty caliber high-power automatic pistol with six or seven inch barrel would prove a valuable arm to carry always on the person. It could be used for large game and yet would not be too large for food birds. It is to be regretted that there is nothing in the market of this character. We had our rifle ammunition packed by the UMC company in zinc cases of one hundred rounds each, a metallic strip with pull ring closing the two halves of the box. Shot cartridge, 16 gauge, were packed in the same way, 25 to the box. The explorer would do well always to have on his person a compass, a light waterproof bag containing matches, a waterproof box of salt, and a strong light linen or fresh silk line, with several hooks, a knife, and an automatic at his belt, with several loaded magazines for the latter in his pocket, thus provided if accidentally lost for several days in the forest, which often happens to rubber hunters in Brazil, he'll be provided with the possibility of getting game and making himself shelter and fire at night. Fish. For small fish like the pacu and piranha, an ordinary bass hook will do. For the latter, because of its sharp teeth, a hook with a long shank and phosphor bronze leader is the best. The same character of leader is best on the hook to be used for the big fish. A tarpon hook will hold most of the great fish of the rivers. A light rod and reel would be a convenience in catching the pacu. We used to fish for the latter variety in the quiet pools while allowing the canoe to drift, and always save some of the fish as bait for the big fellows. We fished for the pacu as the native does, kneading a ball of mandioc farina with water and placing it on the hook as bait. I should not be surprised, though, if it were possible, with carefully chosen flies, to catch some of the fish that every once in a while we saw rise to the surface and drag some luckless insect under. Clothing. Even the experienced traveler, when going into a new field, will commit the crime of carrying too much luggage. Articles which he thought to be camp necessities become camp nuisances which worry his men and kill his mules. The lighter one can travel, the better. In the matter of clothing, before the actual wilderness is reached, the costume one would wear to business in New York in summer is practical for most of South America, except, of course, the high mountain regions, where a warm wrap is necessary. A white or natural linen suit is a very comfortable garment. A light blue unlined serge is desirable as a change and for wear in rainy weather. Strange to relate, the South American seems to have a fondness for stiff collars. 
Even in Colombia, the hottest place I have ever been in, the native does not think he is dressed unless he wears one of the stiff abominations around his throat. A light negligee shirt with interchangeable or attached soft collars is vastly preferred. In the frontier regions and along the rivers, the pajama seems to be the conventional garment for day as well as nightwear. Several such suits of light material should be carried. The more ornamented and beautifully colored, the greater favor will they find along the way. A light cravenetted mackintosh is necessary for occasional cool evenings and as a protection against the rain. It should have no cemented rubber seams to open up in the warm, moist climate. Yachting oxfords and a light pair of leather slippers complete the outfit for steamer travel. For the field, two or three light woolen khaki-colored shirts made with two breast pockets with button flaps, two pair of long khaki trousers, two pairs of riding breeches, a khaki coat cut military fashion with four pockets with button flaps, two suits of pajamas, handkerchiefs, socks, etc. would be necessary. The poncho should extend to below the knees and should be provided with a hood large enough to cover the helmet. It should have no cemented seams. The material recently adopted by the United States Army for ponchos seems to be the best. For footgear, the traveler needs two pairs of stout, high hunting shoes built on the moccasin form with soles. Hobnails should be taken along to insert if the going is over rocky places. It is also advisable to provide a pair of very light leather slipper boots to reach just under the knee for wear in camp. They protect the legs and ankles from insect stings and bites. The traveler who enters tropical South America should protect his head with a wide-brimmed, soft felt hat with ventilated headband, or the best and lightest pith helmet that can be secured. Head nets with face plates of horsehair are the best protection against small insect pests. They are generally made too small, and the purchaser should be careful to get one large enough to go over his helmet and come down to the breast. Several pairs of loose gloves, rather long in the wrist, will be needed as protection against the flies, PMs, and barachutas, which draw blood with every bite and are numerous in many parts of South America. A waterproof sun umbrella, with a jointed handle about six feet long terminating in a point, would be a decided help to the scientist at work in the field. A fine mesh net fitting around the edge of the umbrella would make it insect proof. When folded, it would not be bulky and its weight would be negligible. Such an umbrella could also be attached with a special clamp to the thwart of a canoe and so prove a protection from both sun and rain. There are little personal conveniences which sometimes grow into necessities. One of these, in my own case, is a little electric flashlight taken for the purpose of reading the verniers of a theodolite or sextant in star observations. It was used every night and for many purposes. As a matter of necessity, where insects are numerous, one turns to the protection of his hammock and net immediately after the evening meal. It was at such times I found that the electric lamp was so helpful. Reclining in the hammock, I held the stock of the light under my left arm and with a diary in my lap wrote up my records for the day. I sometimes read by its soft, steady light. One charge of the battery, to my surprise, lasted nearly a month. When forced to pick out a camping spot after dark, an experience which comes to every traveler in the tropics in the raining season, we found its light to be very helpful. Neither rain nor wind could put it out, and the light could be directed wherever needed. The charges should be calculated on the plan of one every three weeks. The acetylene lamp for camp illumination is an advance over the kerosene lantern. It has been found that for equal weight the carbide will give more light than kerosene or candle. The carbide should be put in small containers. For each time a box is opened, some of the contents turns into gas from contact with the moist air. Tools Three or four good axes, several bill hooks, a good hatchet with hammerhead, and nail puller should be in the tool kit. In addition, each man should be provided with belt knife and machete with sheath. Collins makes the best matches. His axes, too, are excellent. The bill hook, called foice in Brazil, is the most valuable tool for clearing away small trees, vines, and undergrowths. It is marvelous how quickly an experienced hand can clear the ground in a forest with one of these instruments. All of these tools should have handles of second growth American hickory of first quality, and several extra handles should be taken along. The list of tools should be completed with a small outfit of pliers, tweezers, files, etc. 
the character, of course, depending upon the mechanical ability of the traveler and the scientific instruments he has with him that might need repairs. Survey Instruments The choice of instruments will depend largely upon the character of the work intended. If a compass survey will suffice, there is nothing better than the cavalry sketching board used in the United States Army for reconnaissance. With a careful hand, it approaches the high degree of perfection attained by the plane table method. It is particularly adapted for river survey, and after one gets accustomed to its use, it is very simple. If the prismatic compass is preferred, nothing smaller than two and one-half inches in diameter should be used. In the smaller sizes, the magnet is not powerful enough to move the dial quickly or accurately. Several good pocket compasses must be provided. They should all have good-sized needles with the north end well marked and degrees engraved in metal. If a floating dial is preferred, it should be of aluminum and nothing smaller than two and one-half inches for the same reason as mentioned above regarding the prismatic compass. Expense should not be spared if it is necessary to secure good compasses. Avoid paper dials and leather cases which absorb moisture. The compass case should allow taking apart for cleaning and drying. The regular chronometer movement, because of its delicacy, is out of the question for rough land or water travel. We had with us a small-sized half-chronometer movement recently brought out by the Waltham Company as a yacht chronometer. It gave a surprisingly even rate under the most adverse conditions. I was sorry to lose it in the rapids of the Papagao when our canoes went down. The watches should be waterproof with strong cases, and several should be taken. It would be well to have a dozen cheap but good watches and the same number of compasses for use around camp and for gifts or trade along the line of travel. Money is of no value after one leaves the settlements. I was surprised to find that many of the rubber hunters were not provided with compasses, and I listened to an American who told of having been lost in the depths of the great forest where for days he lived on monkey meat secured with his rifle until he found his way to the river. He had no compass and could not get one. I was sorry I had none to give. I had lost mine in the rapids. For the determination of latitude and longitude, there is nothing better than a small four or five inch theodolite not over fifteen pounds in weight. It should have a good prism eyepiece with an angle tube attached so it would not be necessary to break one's neck in reading high altitudes. For days we traveled in the direction the sun was going, with altitudes varying from 88 degrees to 90 degrees. Because of these high altitudes of the sun, the sextant with artificial horizon could not be used unless one depended upon star observations altogether, an uncertain dependence because of the many cloudy nights. Barometers. The Goldsmith form of direct reading aneroid is the most accurate portable instrument and of course should be compared with the standard mercurial at the last weather bureau station. Thermometers. A swing thermometer with wet and dry bulbs for determination of the amount of moisture in the air and the maximum and minimum thermometer of the signal service or weather bureau type should be provided with a case to protect them from injury. A tape measure with metric scale of measurements on one side and feet and inches on the other is most important. Two small, light, waterproof cases could be constructed and packed with scientific instruments, data, and spare clothing and yet not exceed the weight limit of flotation. In transit by pack train, these two cases would form but one mule load. Photographic from the experience gained in several fields of exploration, it seems to me that the voyager should limit himself to one small-sized camera, which he can always have with him, and then carry a duplicate of it soldered in tin in the baggage. The duplicate need not be equipped with as expensive a lens and shutter as the camera carried for work. Three and one quarter by four and one quarter is a good size. Nothing larger than three and a quarter by five and a half is advised. We carried the 3A special Kodak and found it a light, strong, and efficient instrument. It seems to me that the ideal form of instrument would be one with a front board large enough to contain an adapter fitted for three lenses. For the 3 and one quarter by 4 and one quarter, one lens 4 or 4 and a half focus, one lens 6 or 7 focus, one lens telephoto or telecentric 9 to 12 focus. The camera should be made of metal and fitted with a focal plane shutter and direct viewfinder. A sole leather case with shoulder strap should contain the camera and lenses with an extra roll of films, 
all within instant reach so that a lens could be changed without any loss of time. Plates, of course, are the best, but their weight and frailty, with difficulty of handling, rule them out of the question. The roll film is the best, as the film pack sticks together and the stubs pull off in the moist, hot climate. The films should be purchased in rolls of six exposures, each roll in a tin, the cover sealed with surgical tape. Twelve of these tubes should be soldered in a tin box. In places where the air is charged with moisture, a roll of film should not be left in a camera for over 24 hours. Tank development is best for the field. The tanks provided for developing by the Kodak Company are the best for fixing also. A nest of tanks would be a convenience. One tank should be kept separate for the fixing bath. As suggested in the Kodak Circular, for tropical development a large size tank can be used for holding the freezing mixture of hypo. The same tank would become the fixing tank after development. In the rainy season it is a difficult matter to dry films. Development in the field, with washing water at 80 degrees Fahrenheit, is a patient's trying operation. It has occurred to me that a small air pump with a supply of chloride of calcium in small tubes might solve the problem of preserving films in the tropics. The air pump and supply of chloride of calcium would not be as heavy or bulky as the tanks and powders needed for development. By means of the air pump, the films could be sealed in tin tubes, free from moisture, and kept thus until arrival at home or at a city where the air was fairly dry, and cold water for washing could be had. While I cordially agree with most of the views expressed by Mr. Fiala, there are some as to which I disagree. For instance, we came very strongly to the conclusion, in descending the Divida, where bulk was of great consequence that the films should be in rolls of 10 or 12 exposures. I doubt whether the four-barrel gun would be practical, but this is a matter of personal taste. Appendix C My letter of May 1 to General Lauro Muir The first report on the expedition made by me immediately after my arrival at Manos and published in Rio de Janeiro upon its receipt is as follows. May 1, 1914 to His Excellency, the Minister of Foreign Affairs, Rio de Janeiro, my dear General Lauro Mueller. I first wish to express my profound acknowledgments to you personally and to the other members of the Brazilian government whose generous courtesy alone rendered possible the Expedicio Scientifica Roosevelt Rondon. I wish also to express my high admiration and regard for Colonel Rondon and his associates who have been my colleagues in this work of exploration. In the third place, I wish to point out that what we have just done was rendered possible only by the hard and perilous labor of the Brazilian Telegraphic Commission in the unexplored western wilderness of Mato Grosso during the last seven years. We have had a hard and somewhat dangerous but very successful trip. No less than six weeks were spent in slowly and with great peril and exhausting labor, forcing our way down through what seemed literally endless succession of rapids and cataracts. For forty-eight days we saw no human being. In passing these rapids we lost five of the seven canoes with which we started and had to build others. One of our best men lost his life in the rapids. Under the strain one of the men went completely bad, shirked all his work, stole his comrade's food, and when punished by the sergeant he with cold-blooded deliberation murdered the sergeant and fled into the wilderness. Colonel Rondon's dog, running ahead of him while hunting, was shot by two Indians. By his death, he in all probability saved the life of his master. We have put on the map a river about 1,500 kilometers in length, running from just south of the 13th degree to north of the 5th degree, and the biggest affluent of the Madeira. Until now, its upper course has been utterly unknown to everyone, and its lower course, although known for years to the rubbermen, utterly unknown to all cartographers. Its source is between the 12th and 13th parallels of latitude south, and between longitude 59 degrees and longitude 60 degrees west from Greenwich. We embarked on it at about latitude 12 degrees 1 minute south, and longitude 60 degrees 18 west. After that, its entire course was between the 60th and 61st degrees of longitude, approaching the latter most closely about in latitude 8 degrees 15 minutes. 
The first rapids were at Navite, in 11 degrees 44 minutes, and after that they were continuous and very difficult and dangerous until the rapids named after the murdered Sergeant Pichon in 11 degrees 12 minutes. At 11 degrees 23 minutes, the river received the Rio Kermit from the left. At 11 degrees 22 minutes, the Marciano Avila entered it from the right. At 11 degrees 18 minutes, the Tunay entered from the left. At 10 degrees 58 minutes, the Cardozo entered from the right. At 10 degrees 24 minutes, we encountered the first rubberman. The Rio Branco entered from the left at 9 degrees 38 minutes. We camped at 8 degrees 49 minutes, or approximately the boundary line between Mato Grosso and the Amazonas. The confluence with the upper Arapuanan, which entered from the right, was in 7 degrees 34 minutes. The mouth where it entered the Madeira was in about 5 degrees 30 minutes. The stream we have followed down is that which rises farthest away from the mouth, and its general course is almost due north. My dear sir, I thank you from my heart for the chance to take part in this great work of exploration. With high regard and respect, believe me, very sincerely yours, Theodore Roosevelt. End of Appendix B End of Through the Brazilian Wilderness by Theodore Roosevelt